I just want to take uh, this opportunity again to welcome you to uh, our online uh, teaching. And again, we're praying that this is encouraging you in your journey <clears throat> and in your faith. Uh, and we want to walk, walk alongside of you. So feel free to reach out to us and uh, let us know if we can pray for you. Uh, any way we can serve you, uh, we would love to do that. Well, this weekend is a little bit of an abbreviated message. Uh, <clears throat> some really, some bittersweet uh, things are happening at Discovery Point, and some of the sweet things are we're baptizing this weekend. We're always excited about that. And a little bit of the bitter side of the coin is that this is the last weekend uh, that Gregory and his wife, Claire Grace, who have served <clears throat> as our student leaders for the last five and a half years, uh, this is their last weekend with us. They're transitioning to that next opportunity, that next kingdom assignment. And uh, we're, we're sad to see them go, and, uh, but we know it's exactly uh, what the Lord has uh, for their next season of ministry and life. Why don't you join me in prayer as we begin? Father, we thank you for the chance to be together. And so, Lord, we pray that your spirit is the one teaching and exhorting us today. And we want to make room for you to speak to us. May we clear those things in our heart and in our mind that are distracting, the worry, the fear, the uncertainties, maybe, Lord, that we're processing. Open our spirit up to the word of God. So, Lord, we want to confess that we are ready to receive what you have for us. In the name of Christ, we pray this. Amen. We're continuing through this conversation through... Uh, first John and uh, with a series entitled call to love you know it is likely that the Apostle John may have been the last person living who had actually walked and talked with Jesus Christ while he was on this earth I, I think that's something to note because John is obviously in his latter years of life and He's writing to a group of churches in an area that we're calling Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And he's encouraging them and he's warning them about what is happening and what is emerging uh, along the lines of what's happening in those New Testament churches. And so uh, we saw last week as Pastor Rod unpacked this beautiful message in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 27, where, where John is warning those first-century believers of, of false teachers and this emerging spirit of the Antichrist. Uh, but he also reminded them of the anointing that they had in Jesus Christ. And he, he ended that, that section with that encouragement. And as we close chapter 2, I want you to note that we are going to be touching on one of John's favorite subjects. One of his favorite subjects, in, in fact, maybe you know someone, maybe you have a friend or a family member that that you know when you're around them and when you're in a conversation with them, you have a pretty good idea where the conversation is headed. And, and we're all like that. It's just a part, I think, of the human experience is that we have some, some favorite conversation points. And, and I think John was that way. And, and I, think, I, I think what he mentions in these two passages, these two scriptures, is some of his favorite conversation points. You, you kind of know where John is going even before he gets there. It's like if, if you ran into John, like at the supermarket, or you ran into John at the Friday night football game, or you ran into John at the gym as you were working out, you kind of knew where John was going and ultimately likely where the conversation would turn toward. And that would be this idea of abiding in Christ. I don't know if it's John's favorite subject, but certainly it is near the top. And, and we see this throughout the book of 1 John. We see it throughout the book. And today we, we see it emerge again. So we see this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. The first part of that verse, notice what John says. And now little children abide in him. Here it is. So he's talked about uh, the false teachers. He's talked about the spirit of the Antichrist that is emerging. He's talked about their anointing. And then he circles back, and, and I love how he begins verse 28, and he says, and now, and now. All we have is now, is this moment. And he reminds them that, that moment by moment, we have this, 
this incredible opportunity to abide in him, and that is to abide in Jesus Christ. This Greek word abide, meno, means, means, of course, to abide, to remain, to dwell. One commentator gives it this idea. It actually means to make oneself at home. We know that John uses the word abide more than any other New Testament writers. In fact, all of them combine. And in this small epistle of 1 John, he uses this word abide some 24 times. So the question is, if John is he's exhorting those believers and us as well to abide, well, what does it mean to abide? Well, just note that further in this, this little book, this little epistle, 1 John, in chapter 4, he, he digs a little deeper into this idea. But I, I just want to mention a, a couple ways that, that we know we are abiding and what does it mean to abide. First of all, it, it, means, that, it, it means that we abide in him when we are trusting in his love. Jesus highlights this in John chapter 15, and he talks about abiding in his love, and, and, and we abide in him when we trust, when we rely in his love. But second of all, when we are responsive to his word, responsive to his word. So I, I want you just to hear those two things. There are other elements to abiding, but for this conversation right now, I, I want you to think about uh, how do I abide in him? How, what does that abiding look like? It looks like, first of all, that I am going to trust his love for me. And, and I can remain in that love. I can rely in his love for me. And as I rely and as I trust his love, a continual trusting, I can know that I'm abiding in him. But it's also being responsive to his word, what he has told us to do. In fact, in John chapter 15, there's this idea that Jesus speaks about is that to abide in him is to obey his commands. So how do we know that we are abiding? Well, we're trusting his love. And second of all, not only that, we are responding to his words and the words that we know that we see him teaching and sharing in the Gospels. So there's more to the conversation, but just think about those two things. How do I abide? Well, I abide by trusting in his love. And then by being responsive to his word. I think abiding is so important is one of the last conversations that Jesus had with his disciples. And here we see John bringing it back. He's circling back to this incredibly important conversation. So I, we must ask the question, why is it so important for believers to be abiding in Christ? To abide in Christ. There's multiple reasons. Let me just give you three. One is, first of all, Jesus says, abiding in him is how we bear fruit. It's how our lives are producing fruit of the kingdom. As we abide, remember Jesus uses the idea of the, the vine and the branch. So that, 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 that idea of a tree and a branch and that, that branch is producing that fruit because it is connected to the vine. Same idea is that we are to abide, and when we do, the promise of that is, is that we are producing fruit. A second reason that abiding is important is this. It is how we resist false teaching, and it's also how we're able to recognize the spirit of the Antichrist. It's how we recognize the spirit of the Antichrist. As I abide in Christ, the living Christ, this mutual abiding, as I do that, then I'm able to recognize false teaching, and I'm also able to recognize the spirit of the Antichrist. But in our text for today, there's a third reason I want to mention, and it is this. It is how we are to live in light of Christ's return. So, for example, look in the text, 1 John chapter 2, the second part of verse 28. Notice what he says. He says, we want to abide in him. Here it is. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him in shame at his coming. There it is. We abide in Christ, right? So that when he appears, listen to these words. When he appears, we are not, we, we are, we're, 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 we're walking with a humble confidence in him because we're abiding in him. And therefore, we do not have to shrink back in shame when he appears and when he returns. This is a powerful idea. The return of Christ is mentioned 
some 318 times in the 260 chapters of the New Testament. I want you to think about that idea, this idea of, of the return of Christ, his appearing, 318 times in the 260 chapters in the New Testament. It's always been a hot topic. I mean, ever since I can look back on my spiritual journey, the return of Christ, and there's various teachings about this, and there's various camps about the return of Christ. And the big piece is, well, when is he going to return? If he would just tell us when he is returning, that helps us prepare for his returning. If he would just tell us. So, for example, if we knew that next Sunday, October the 15th, at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, that Jesus was returning, I wonder what the next week would look like for us. How would we live? Would we be more intentional with our faith? Would we share our faith with more courage and boldness? Or actually, would we be more apathetic in our walk with him? If he would just tell us when he's coming back. But maybe that's the beauty. Maybe that's the purpose, is that scholars refer to this as the imminent return of Christ. In other words, it can happen at any moment, at any time. It's imminent. It's imminent. We saw last week that John speaks about this idea that, hey, we're in the last days. We are in the last days, the imminent return of Christ. Let me illustrate it for you this way. Growing up when I was, you know, 10 or 12 years old, I, I loved to play Nerf basketball. I, I can kind of visualize in my room uh, that I had a Nerf goal and had that little orange Nerf basketball. And maybe, maybe you remember that, that game, and man, I love to play Nerf basketball. I thought I was a Nerf basketball all-star. I mean, if they had had a pro league back in the day, I might have been in the pros of Nerf basketball. And from time to time, you know, my buddies would come over and, 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 and to play Nerf basketball in my room, we had to shut the door because the goal was on the back side of the door that led into my room. So we would have to close the door. And man, when a few of us were in there playing Nerf basketball, man, it was bizarre. It was a circus. We'd jump over the bed and knock things out. And it was just total chaos. And I remember those moments sometimes, maybe when my mom would, she would knock on the door, stick her head in my room and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm running to the store. Oh, and by the way, before I get back, you guys need to straighten this room up. <laughs> you need to straighten this room up. She didn't say, I'll be back in 30 minutes. I'll be back in 20 minutes. I'll be back in 45 minutes. She just said, well, by the time I get back, you need to straighten this room up. Oh, man, as soon as she closed that door and we heard the car leave our house, man, we got back into another Nerf game. Just chaos, just chaos. But there was always maybe that one buddy of mine, he's like, hey, you know, your mother said before she returns, you need to straighten this mess up. You need to get this room back together to some degree, at least pick it up and look like we made an effort. There was always that one friend who's like, hey, just remember, your mom's coming back. And we're like, man, we have no idea when. And so we, we, we paid attention with this. We knew that when we heard the car pull into the driveway, that was the time to get this thing back together, right? That, that was the time to tidy up and, and, and bring it all back together. But the beauty of my mom going to the store is she's never said, I'm going to give you a heads up when I'm coming back. I'll let you know when I'm on the way. No, it, it's that imminent return. It's that we're, we're not sure. And, and that's the beauty of Christ's return. It's like we are not sure when he's returning. It's imminent. It could be at any moment, ready or not, He's going to return. And so I think John is taking us back to this idea that, that we need to be ready. Theodore Epps said this, We need to live as though as Christ died yesterday, rose from the grave today, and is coming back tomorrow. That's the beauty of the imminent return, and that's why it's important that we are abiding in Christ, is that we will be ready for this imminent return. And we can be ready, as John says, with a humble confidence, knowing that we are actually walking with the Lord. And if he comes back, wherever we are and whatever we're doing and whatever we're up to, we can have a humble confidence that he will find us seeking to live for him. The other option he talks about is this idea of shrinking in shame. 
while we may be a believer, he's talking about not living our lives as we should live them upon the return of Christ. Kind of like my mom coming back home and finding the room just as it was when she told us to tidy it up. I mean, I'm part of the family. I'm her son, if you will. Shrinking in shame. How, how are you living? How are you abiding? It's something to consider. It's something, I think, that John wants us to think about in this teaching. Notice what he says in verse 29. He says, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness, which means a right relationship with God, has been born of him. Practicing righteousness. You know, when I look at that a little deeper, what I hear is quite frankly what John had heard in John chapter 15 when Jesus was teaching on abiding. And, and, and Jesus used that language of bearing fruit, right? You will know a tree by its fruits. I, I think it's the same idea here that there's this bearing fruit principle. In, in other words, one of the ways that we know we're actually abiding in Christ is that we are living a life of righteousness, we're in right relationship, right fellowship with the Heavenly Father. That's the thing about this walk with Christ is that there is a visibility element to it. Whether we are aware of it, whether we value it, whether we know it, there's this element of righteousness and, and, and that manifests itself in our relationship to the Father. You know... One theologian says, when someone is born of someone else, there is almost always a family resemblance. We often say things like, look, she has her mother's eyes, or hey, notice he has his father's nose, whatever. You know, there, there's those features, and we do it, right? I mean, you've done that. Just this past Thursday, uh, our family, our daughter and son-in-law, gave birth to uh, a, a baby girl and it's their second daughter and and Sharon and I's second second grandchild and she was born uh, pretty early on Thursday morning and and by the time we got things together and made our way to the hospital she was born probably around 7 15 a.m. I think we finally arrived you know maybe around 8 15 or 8 30 at the hospital and we'd already seen a picture, but we actually hadn't seen baby Hattie just yet. So as we made our way into the hospital room where our daughter and son-in-law were celebrating a tired <laughs> celebration, right, of this newborn child that the Lord had, had given them, we walk immediately up to my daughter who's, who's laying in the bed and holding, holding little Hattie. And after we oohed and awed, just for like, seem like seconds, then the conversation turned to this. Who does she look like? Who does she resemble? Who does she look like? And it's hard to tell. You know, she had the hat on and kind of scrunched up <clears throat> uh, in, into my daughter. And it was kind of hard to tell. So that was Thursday morning. And then Thursday afternoon, uh, my wife and I, we were in a conversation. We weren't at the hospital. And my wife said, well, you know what? Kaylee, who is our daughter, Kaylee says she looks like you, speaking <laughs> of me, right? I'm like, looks like me. Poor girl. But it's the idea of resemblance, right? It's the idea, and, and that's what John is speaking about. If we've truly been born from above, we will resemble our Heavenly Father in so many ways. As the theologian said, God has no children destitute of his image or who resemble him not. I tell you, ready or not, the Lord is coming. If you've never said yes to Jesus Christ, if you've never said yes, now is the time. It's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. This is the accepted time. Would you just take a moment if you're watching this online and just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my life. I turn my life over to you. And in a simple prayer, say, Jesus, I, I, I give you my life. I want to be born again into your family. 
and learn what it means to abide in you. If you've said that or you want to pray that prayer, will you reach out to me, please? My email is greg at discoverypointaz.com. Love to have a conversation with you. Help you take those next steps of faith in Christ. Maybe you're already a believer. How are you abiding? If he returned right now in this moment, Would you feel confident about your walk, a a humble confidence? Or would there be an element of shame? Would there be an element of shrinking back because of how you're living your life? If that's you today, get right with the Lord. Let's abide in Him. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this word. We pray it goes deep within our spirit and brings forth fruit. Give us a holy ambition to abide, to walk with you, Father. Give us that, that passion to, to, to not only be in Christ, but, but to know we are loved by Christ. And then, Father, give us that discernment and that faith to obey his words, to respond to what he's told us to do. And, Father, in the end, may you strengthen the abiding element of our journey with your Son, that you receive the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. God bless you.